You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. This is Telling It Like It Is, our weekly look at the stories making the headlines. With me in the studio is the former Kremlin adviser, Alexander Nekrasov. Also here in the studio is the broadcaster, James Whale. In Egypt, the scenes certainly were distressing yesterday when two camps in, in Cairo uh, were cleared by the authorities. At the moment, the death toll is running into the hundreds. Some are describing it as, as Egypt's Tiananmen Square. I'd just like to get your view, uh, Alexander, on what is going on. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood said that, well, a lot of the people in the camps wanted to be martyrs. It seems like they're getting their wish. I mean, what do you think? Well, I think that it's a strange situation because the Muslim Brotherhood claims that these were all the victims, all the killed people were unarmed civilians, uh, including women and children. And then we learn that 45 cops or something were killed, shot. So some, somebody somewhere is not saying, telling the truth. And when you hear that there are you know, soldiers and, 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 and policemen being shot by protesters, you realize that this is not just a peaceful demonstration or a peaceful standoff. It's a battle. Mm. And I think that what we're seeing now in uh, Egypt is the beginning of a civil war. But what is amazing for a Russian um, watching how the Western media covers the situation, I find it amazing that many of the journalists side with the Muslim Brotherhood and talk about just like a one-sided uh, coverage saying that the people are angry, this was a coup, President Morsi was ousted, and so on and so on. It, it isn't really a coup as a coup. Well, but which James Whale, well, I mean, it's not quite siding with the Muslim Brotherhood, well, more siding with democracy in the fact that here is a man, Mohamed Morsi, who was elected by the people. The democratization of the region is something that's a, it's a real okay. pledge of the West. I mean, that's what they're wanting. You've got to take what Alex says with a pinch of salt, really. I don't, first of all, I don't think the media in the West sided with, uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood at all. I think what happened was that when the Muslim Brotherhood's uh, government was suggesting some sort of pro-religious legislation that was upsetting everybody. You found the West was a bit against it and said, no, this, you know, it's, it's imposing your views on people who don't feel the same way. And then, of course, when the uh, when the army took over, which is what I think a lot of the Western media was hoping would happen, uh, then they got all very uh, upset about it. There were some very disturbing pictures today, going back to what you said uh, Alex, uh, about the uh, police and the army being attacked, there was a, an army Land Rover pushed off a bridge with the occupants inside, and then the protesters stoned them to death whilst they were uh, badly injured in the car. And I think we, you're right, it is sliding into a, a, a civil war in Egypt. And I think we have to first of all ask the question, does Western democracy really work all over the world? I don't think it will. I don't think in countries in the Middle East uh, you can expect the sort of m democracy that we have here to actually be, be there. You know, this idea of, of being a martyr for something that may or may not exist. I can't understand it. Can you? But well, I, I can I understand the feelings that are running high, but what I can't understand is that President Moore Morsi was not exactly a Democrat. When they took power, exactly. the, the Muslim Brotherhood and President Morsi, they started to introduce pretty tight legislation and attacking uh, human rights and but so But here's on. the thing. Can you actually expect any of these countries that have fairly difficult, that, that they have tribal systems which are very difficult for us to understand, you need a tough person, almost a dictator, don't you, to keep the control of these countries, which is what has happened well, over the years. Well, they all had secular tough uh, dictators uh, running the countries and that's what happened when people started saying we need democracy and by the way the muslim brotherhood always talks about freedom and democracy you know those people you see on the street they all know all those words they use them quite cunningly and then they go and burn free christian churches now I, f I think it's a civil war i think the west doesn't know what to do i think the saudis are pulling the strings they've given a lot of money to morsi they want their money back and they want some effect for it. So who and started the Arab Spring? You know, there are the, the the cynics amongst us might say, well, it was the CIA, wasn't it? Or maybe nah, it was... the CIA is maybe too it stupid. Was, uh, for, come on. Come I think on. it was started in Tunisia, wasn't it? It was started in Tunisia. Um, there was well, a market trader. It there was a market trader who, who felt that he wasn't... Uh, well, actually, what sparked it wasn't a desire for democracy, some would say. He was... Uh, people in Tunisia wanted to earn a living and they were unable to under an Islamist uh, mm. regime. But in terms of... Um, it sounds like the West is tying itself up a bit in not... Certainly, I heard... Uh, 
the US uh, White House spokesman yesterday s- refer to it as a coup. We think it was a slip of the tongue, but up until now, the US have specifically said that this isn't a coup, which gives them the right to continue funding the Egyptian military. Um, it's sending conflicting messages to the West, so perhaps, uh, to, to the Egyptians. So one, I'm wondering, Alexander, do you think that perhaps the West have sold this idea of democracy like a marketing man, but it's not the kind of democracy that can actually possibly work in, the, in an Arab country? Well, it, it didn't sell well, actually, because every time we have seen all those rebels or protesters uh, on the streets shouting democracy, freedom, and by the way, talking to Western hacks in a way that like, they sounded like promoting some sort of a new regime, a new, a new rule, and so on. And then it all turned out nasty. And I think Libya was the turning point of uh, You see, if we all left spring. everybody alone to get on with their own countries, we'd all be a lot better off, wouldn't we? We've got enough problems here. Let's get on and sort those out. Yeah, but Stop that, that doesn't work here there. because a lot of uh, regional powers, dictatorships, by the way, they, they interfere now. You know the European Union is starting to, to do something about Egypt. Why? Because everybody says we hate the Americans. We don't want them here. Both sides. So that's a problem. Okay, for okay. Americans. So... So here's the the thing. Do you see Egypt going like Syria? And if you do see Egypt going like Syria, what will be next? Will Lebanon be next? Will then it spill into the Middle East? I mean, I I thought we were quite hopeful for peace talks in in Israel in the next week or so. Or is it just going down the tubes? Well, you know what happened in Israel. They they, they, they allowed 900 more new settlements. More building, yes, of course. I mean, settlements. But they released uh, prisoners as well. Yes, well, I know, but that was a cunning move, wasn't it? They, they released the prisoners, and at the same day, they announced new settlements, and the Palestinians are already saying, no, guys, this won't work, because the, the same reason for the breakup of the previous process was exactly the settlement. So, um, I think no. it's a, a horrendous situation the world finds itself in at the moment, and uh, it seems to me, here we are in the 21st century, and the biggest argument still is is in people's belief systems in something that may or may not be true. I'm not saying there is uh, nothing in religion. No, I don't the, the, know. It's geopolitics. But... Come on, come on. It's geopolitics. You think so? it's, it's a struggle for power. I don't know. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's a struggle for power. But what do people do when they get power? They're very unhappy, aren't well, they? Well, get... you saw what happened in Egypt. You yeah, see, exactly. They got power and they didn't know what to do with it. That's the problem. So do you have confidence in these peace talks, Alexander? You see, the problem is we don't have an international structure to sort out those sort of crises. The United Nations is hopeless. Look at the United Nations. They're all on holiday, all of them. And they don't even, you know, they don't even do anything at the time when there's a problem that, that can, the whole of the Middle East can explode. No one. They're mm. all away. Well, that's OK. There's nobody in the House of uh, Commons either at the moment. They're all away they too. They don't Are matter. They all... Come on. They don't matter. <laughs> Cameron does what he wants. Come on. Who, who cares about you know the House of Commons? You that's not true. Don't be it ridiculous. It is true. It's, it started under Tony, Tony Blair. Tony Blair's still in charge. Tony Blair's yeah, running the show. Yeah, he's still in charge. Yeah, running the show. Yeah, you know, he calls. He calls. Uh, that's ridiculous. He calls way, Cameron well. and tells him what to do. Still. Yeah. And Cameron yeah. does not deny this. Did you see Tony Blair's successor, Dave, uh, Edward Miliband? Oh, that, that was a slip of the tongue. Getting an egg thrown at him yesterday. Do you know I said that on Sky News? trying to get in touch today. with the people, wasn't yeah, he? And well, he, did. What he did. He, he got but in he, touch. You know, that's assault, and you could do the guy for doing it, but would, would anybody no, have the wish man. to do it? Come yeah, on. he had some assault. You could, you, that, that's against assault. the law. But it does actually bring politicians back to reality, doesn't it? And it makes them realise that not everybody loves them, because when they go out in crowds like that, all their reminders and all their sycophants get get all the people to say, oh, he's great, old Ed, Yeah, well, Blair did bloke. that. Blair yes, did absolutely. that. Don't you think, listen, when David Cameron visits a school or he visits a factory, you never see any dissenting people, do you? They choose the people that they want to be photographed. No, it start, I'm with. sorry, it started with Tony Blair. He never had a hostile interview. Because before him, Major, he was slaughtered by journalists. Come on. Then comes Blair, saintly, and all you folks voted for him. You probably voted as I well. I didn't vote you for him. Did, but I did, didn't I vote bet. for him, and I have never... I, I, in fact, I don't think people like us should vote. I think we should be above politics, and we can then have a go at all politicians. I think they all need but to be brought Blair back to reality. But since Blair came to power, nobody ever interviewed either Blair or yeah, but Brown you know why or Cameron that, hang on, under duress. Hang you know, on. Under the, reason, duress. the reason for that is that they will not do interviews. Same with David Cameron. I interviewed David Cameron before he became Prime Minister and I asked him some questions that made him squirm slightly and he never agreed to do an interview after that. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. This is our weekly programme, Telling It Like It Is. With me in the studio is Alexander Nekrasov. He's a former Kremlin advisor. 
I'm also joined by the broadcaster, James Whale. Speaking of political interviews, did you see the interview with the uh, UKIP politician, Godfrey Bloom? He was on Channel 4 News and he got, he got completely fed up with being asked the same question over and over again. And he stormed out, but it was over his comments uh, regarding Bongo Bongo Land. I'm sorry. It's, a, it's a stupid it's thing a to stupid say. It's a stupid thing to say. And he, he's a man who, who thinks that he can be, you know, he's going he's gonna to tell it like it is. And, but you have to have some, you know, some understanding of people's sensitivities. And you don't make a ridiculous statement like that. Because what he was talking about was the fact that Britain that is in financial crisis is still giving something like £8 billion pounds 11, of money. 11. All right, 11, Alex whatever it is, it's a lot of money, more than you and I have, to countries that need it in aid. One of these countries is India. India that has just uh, shown off its new uh, aircraft carrier. It has a space program and it has nuclear deterrents and everything else. And we, impoverished Impoverished Britain are giving money to countries like this. It's ridiculous. So yes, he but had you a made point, your empire. You built your in- empire on robbing India. By the way, you stole so much from look, India that now look, you Trump, need to if, give back. If you to want India, to talk about empire, let's talk about the Russian empire. The Russian for a empire while. was a beautiful would, empire. You know, beautiful let's, empire. Let's not talk about that. Some people say that perhaps the world was better governed by the British than anyone else. No, but you're getting back to. But getting back that. to getting back to Mr. Bl- and his uh, not just boom. They are now created a test for all their members and candidates to all positions. But what Mr. Bloom said is probably felt by a lot of people out uh, right throughout the country. They probably the agree with it. No, but he didn't put it properly in proper yeah. words. But now they're having a test. And um, uh, James Dellingpole failed that test because he was considered a uh, fruitcake. Mm. James, by the way, <laughs> was supposed to write for my website. Mm. And um, I think now they went to another extreme. So now they want to yeah. ban everybody who says something which is not politically correct. I'll tell you what the problem is. I think Nigel Farage is a very charismatic politician. And I we think are a going lot to of, call him to this program. We're going to right? get him on okay. the program right. in the future. Oh, yeah. But I think what has happened is that, that they have suddenly become very popular. Lots of people want a piece of UKIP. And they don't have the money or the backing to do the sort of vetting of the people who want to become members and who want to put themselves Why should up. they be vetting anybody? Well, what because, is you, you know, That's could you young, imagine... Young you getting league. into a political party and god forbid you could become a candidate so what yeah. i was an advisor to the kremlin to the governments i, I can talk advisor properly advisor is fine but you don't want you i can out convince in people i convinced that gay athlete on the bbc to go to <laughs> russia without any fear and he said i'm going so I can do it in a few minutes, by the way. But maybe and this is a, this is a shortage of spin doctors, or maybe somebody, maybe the UKIP needs a Linton Crosby type figure who can actually kind Linton of finesse Crosby this sort of thing. Linton Crosby is not a great figure. Don't it's, wind it's, him it's, up, oh, please. Come on, Don't Crosby. mention his name. The, 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 the Tories. But I've opened up a can of worms. Yeah, here. I've just you had an like idea. Crosby. I've had an idea. I will introduce you to Nigel. Okay, right? all right. And you can on the program. His, uh, yeah, his on advisor. the program, we will talk, uh, you know, b- with him, and you he would, will change. He will change. Do you think you could advise I him? I think he will stop appearing with a pint, with a pint, <laughs> trying to, to be seen as a working class lad. <laughs> you know, enough is enough. He's an MEP. His salary is what? Hundred grand, more, more than a hundred grand. So he needs to look like an MEP. Well, we'll see how their election campaign is going to go ahead of 2015. But another election campaign in the United States ahead of 2016, and this is Barack Obama's potential successor. Yes, um, Hillary yes, Clinton. Hillary, what yes. do we think about what's uh, some of the mood music coming from Washington and well, coming that, from the Clinton this is, camp? This Can is we is possibly see funny. this happening? What's this not is, gonna this happen? is hilarious. It's not happening. It's hilarious actually because obviously she can't run. I mean, Why not? She, she will lose, definitely. Why? Well, first of all, she'll be pulling, pushing on 70, I think, yeah. on that yeah. year. John McCain was 72 when he ran. Uh, uh, she, he didn't get in the, election the, campaign. The, you know, the point is this. Anybody who is associated with Bill Clinton will lose. That's why she lost to Barack Obama. Barack Obama was a novice. No chance. Outsider. Completely. Couldn't, uh, was proven to have been taking huge donations from the big boys of business as a senator. And... To, for him to win, that just showed everybody, everybody, nobody wants to see Bill again, mm. even close to Washington. And that's the reason why she will not win again. I tell and you of what, course, though, although Hillary Clinton, I agree with you, won't win, I don't think she'll become President Clinton the second. 
I think it is time, or I think there is a possibility that a woman should be the next president oh, that's very p- of the United States PCR of America. Real, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not a tool. I think, listen, How they, dare you talk I want, like that on the uh, show. Listen, I think we're going to have a, a president of Russia who's a woman before long, so just watch yourself. No oh, really? And who should, uh, uh, do, do you think uh, Condoleezza Rice could become the next president of the United States? I Come on, remember Iraq. She did a lot of nasty stuff then. You know who I'd like to see as uh, the next president of uh, the United States? Clooney. No, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey. Oh, right. about her? Yes. I mean, that would be good. Well, she was a good, she's a good talker. Yeah, she's she is a good talker, and she tried to buy a, a handbag in Zurich not so long ago, and yes, um, they yes. said, no, this isn't for you. No, 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 they said it's too expensive it's for too, you. I think she's worth about 500 million. No, I think oh. she's over a billion, actually. Is she over a actually, billion? Actually, hang on, guys, you both got it wrong. What, what was the problem? I saw the interview with the shop owner. She wanted to see that bag. Which bag? That bag there. 30 grand. Uh, 45. Okay. 45 grand for All a right. handbag. All That's right. euros, right? Yeah. Yes. And that even so that's expensive. Mm. Uh, I'd like to see that bag up there. Sorry, madam, we can't let you see that bag. Uh, but I want to see that bag. That bag is behind a security screen, and the woman in the shop didn't have the key to undo it. Uh-huh. And she said to her, but I have got something similar. Would you like to see No, I want. Uh, look, I'm Oprah Winfrey. No, I no, she see didn't that say bag. that. She didn't say that. She, that she was Oprah Winfrey. You know, you don't Switzerland, know that. You were Switzerland, there. She could well Switzerland is notorious for not recognizing celebrities. Notorious. And that's why she was upset. Because she, she was standing there and saying, basically, without saying it, I am Oprah Winfrey. I am on the telly Don't every you day. know who I am? Exactly, mm. exactly. But she was without her bodyguard. She was just by herself. And her false eyelashes were at home. And, she, <laughs> and that oh, woman, well, that's what she said herself. So, you see, Oprah suggested that this, this was a sort of racist slur, that the woman in the shop didn't want to show her the bag because she thought a, a woman of colour would not be able to afford it. And I think that perhaps the media has overplayed that, well, I think, because I, if you go into some of these shops, I, I've been turned out of shops, look at me, you can't oh, come in here. Blind. And you have, I know you have. No, I've never been yeah, turned away from you shops. Have. No, you no, know. No. But you because, have to ring the bell of those did, shops to go in. She did afterwards, I should have taken out my Black American Express, which is about 500 grand you know, a day mm-hmm. um, a c- a credit and showed it to her. Then she would have climbed, the, you know, upstairs and got me the bike. But um, now she's missing the point here. I mean, it's Switzerland. They don't care who you are. Unless, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless you're Roger Federer, perhaps. <laughs> well, apart from, from Roger Federer. Now, listen, before, before the Swiss decide to declare war on us, uh, they make nice chocolate. Yeah, They do have nice chocolate. And cuckoo clocks. Well, I don't like cooking the but I mean... And, yeah, and, okay. and they offer good rates on their offshore accounts, but um, now the Russians and most other people, they don't trust them anymore because they reveal names to, you know, <laughs> tax men all across the world. And uh, recently, that many people don't know about this, but the British tax men deducted 40% from all the British citizens who had accounts in, in Switzerland. And they said, if you have any problems, please come to us and explain. Nobody came. But they just took it off. So it's Cyprus number two in Switzerland. Speaking of revelations of highly top secret documents, it was interesting the comments by Bradley Manning uh, today or yesterday apologising for hurting the US by leaking the trove of classified US government documents to WikiLeaks. Um, I mean, James, is he perhaps he's... Seen I sense. I don't know. What is it? What do you think? I feel a bit sorry for him, really. I think he's a guy is a fall guy for the whole silly business. I mean, the the I don't think that anybody has proved uh, that what was leaked has actually in any way endangered the U.S. All it's done is nobody embarrass was sacked, them, which is amazing. You know, isn't it, it? Yeah, I can't imagine why people weren't sacked over making it so easy to get this stuff. To be honest with you, mm. listen, we in Britain are having to suffer flipping Julian Assange costing us this money, stuck in the embassy down there in Knightsbridge. You can never find anywhere to park. There are police all <laughs> over the place. And he's in there, comes out as if he's some kind of pope on the balcony and, and gives a speech well, every I mean, few come days. On, come Send on. him back to Sweden. No, no, it's a nightmare no, no. if you want to get an Ecuadorian visa nowadays. In yeah, yes, get going it's a there. nightmare. Forget yes, going yes. There. and these but, four cops who stand outside, yeah. you know, they actually <laughs> watch everything. They, he does dress as a woman, you mentioned. We I talked think. about yeah, that last yeah, week, yeah, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. 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 But, I mean, that's Ecuador. Neighbouring Peru uh, has been in the news with um, a, a, a That was a, a very really good couple. link, Brandon. May Thank I say, much. that was Thank a very, very good link. We are professional people here, James. Come on. It was geographic. I know my geography. I've know. i been to both countries, actually. But these two girls, very young, are... 
Melissa Reed and Maca- uh, Michaela McCullum trying to board a flight to Madrid with reportedly as you do when you uh, leave 11 Peru. kilograms of <laughs> cocaine what are people what are young people thinking when they're doing their gap year well it's the cash isn't it come on i mean you're offered 50 grand easy you know travel here and there but what i don't understand is why the media in britain is presenting them more of victims rather than come on they they are culprits. They're stupid well they're, they're stupid. stupid yeah they're stupid and this is the story i hear as well is that what the drug barons do is they get a couple of young girls like this or a couple of of of, of, of rather Uh, saying simple is, is, is hurtful, I don't mean it that way, but people are perhaps as not worldly wise as they should be, and they give them this stuff. And then they inform the authorities. There's a leak. And so the authorities are looking for a particular people. That's why they stop them. And then, of course, the people with a real big consignment of drugs, probably a couple of, uh, couple of rows back, and they get through. All right. Now, I don't know. That's just what I heard. But uh, they, they, they carried quite a lot of stuff, 11 kilos of cocaine. That's a lot of money. So if you're saying they were distraction, a mm. distraction, yep. they would have probably carried a small bag, wouldn't they? No, not necessarily. Oh, I mean, on, they might have had a, but there could be. I just I wonder surprised. why anybody goes to countries like that and takes stuff that they don't know what it is. And you can't afterwards say, oh, well, I didn't know. But they claim, they claim that they were forced at gunpoint by Colombian gangsters to carry the drugs. Well, that doesn't well, sound, you know, come on. That, that's uh, not well, the... I don't know. I, I remember interviewing somebody in a similar situation who actually uh, not only was forced to do it, and uh, this was born out of their trial, but they uh, said, listen, we have the address of where you live. Your families live in, in the UK, and if you don't do this then they will suffer. And so these were very young people, and they did, and they got caught. Uh, they did time for it. but Luckily, luckily for these two girls in Peru, Peru does not have the death penalty. They will face a long time well, in jail. Well, 25 years in the jail in Peru. Come on. I mean, what's better? Maybe, That's uh, right. Maybe a five but hopefully, hopefully let's leave. they'll be brought back and punished. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. This is our weekly program, Telling It Like It Is. With me in the studio is Alexander Nekrasov. He's a former Kremlin advisor. I'm also joined by the broadcaster, James Whale. Well, let's leap to another Latin American cu- uh, country. That's Cuba. Have you been oh, there too? Right. I've been there as well. Oh, yes. So yes. Uh, interesting segue there. Yes. But um, interesting comments from Fidel Castro in Granma, the, the national newspaper there. He basically said, he's 87 now, that when he handed the reins over to Raul, his brother, he had no inkling that he would even survive the year. Here he is seven years later, Raul still chasing in power. Chasing women, probably. Probably chasing he women. Was. Yeah, he yeah. was always a charmer. But interesting, interesting that he... Can Kind of, he thought he was on his way out, handed, mm-hmm. and Cuba has actually changed in the last seven years, Alexander, hasn't it? Well, not much. Come on, it's I changed mean, a bit. Well, I mean, it's talking, opened up a little bit. It's like a Gorbachev, but in a sort of a smaller way. I, I remember when um, in the Soviet days, uh, I remember I had friends who were based there, journalists and not journalists, but pretending to be journalists and so on, and they told me horrific stories about uh, Fidel and his security people. They said, "Look, these guys are, are vicious." the security people in, in Cuba. And he said they just whack people all over the place. N- few people know, by the way, that you know there are 11 million people living in Cuba. Because some people would say, oh, yeah, one million people there. It's 11 million. And uh, I think there's a serious problem. I think that um, Fidel, he was a charismatic man, obviously. But I think he really, really was a tyrant. He wasn't. In, he wasn't revered in Russia during the days of the Soviet Union. Well, he was very close links between the countries. You know, of course no, he the, was. no, no, there was a distrust on both what sides. What about the Bay of Pigs? No, no, no. The, what, what about the Bay of Pigs? There's nothing to do with Russia. Or, <laughs> you know, come on, stop this. And uh, there was always distrust, by the way, on both sides with Fidel, because Fidel was doing deals with some very dodgy people. Colombian drug cartels. You know, they so say on. they say that 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 Cuba has the best health. Care system well, supposedly, in the world. Supposedly, yes. Well, look what happened you know to Chavez. Chavez. He come does, on. and that's why probably that he's lived so long. He had some yeah. stomach uh, cancer, and it seems to have well. Been just cured. because an interesting point. Just I had cancer. I had cancer 13 years ago this year, and just because you are diagnosed and you have cancer is not now necessarily a death sentence. In the news today, uh, they've done some remarkable work, and they're going to be able to find out why certain people uh, do actually catch certain cancers. And that statistic the other week was interesting. Prostate cancer has something like a 98% cure if rate you're, now. If you get prostate cancer diagnosed early, then you have 
Yeah, ninety nine point nine percent chance. What does it have cured. to do with Fidel Castro and Cuba? Well, no, well, cancer. He had cancer. Yes. I thought I'd get you off what we were going on right. about and okay. move on to something a little more positive. All right. Okay. You know well, that was exciting. Yes. Well, well yes. anyway, there are eleven million people. They don't like it. It needs to change. And I think that America, <laughs> America, is being hypocritical while trying to install democracy, for example, in Iraq. But nothing happens in Cuba. No. Well, there I think, they are, listen, 90 I, miles l- away l- from l- America. L- I think, and, and I can imagine what's going to happen if they try and uh, inflict their th- sort of democracy on Cuba, as, uh, as we've discussed before. You start trying to say to other people, well, live like we do, and uh, you can be like us, and it doesn't work. But the sheer number of Cuban Americans suggests that Cuba will eventually come in from the cold, maybe yeah. in a generation's time. I mean, it, it will happen, won't it, Alexander? Of course it will. Well, it, it will happen, of course. But you see, with American track record, look at Mexico, for example. Mexico has a civil war which is not talked about because these gang, uh, these drug cartels are out of control completely. They control vast territories. Why? Because they supply dope to America. What America does about it? Nothing. And I, I find it pathetic that around America there are situations which... I don't know. Mexico can erupt in any moment, right? So they're going over there. F- so you don't of miles. you don't like the idea of legalizing, decriminalizing, doing no, something like that. No, I don't like, like that. So idea what at is all. the answer to the problem the world has with drugs? Then uh, remember that we have alcohol and nicotine, which are drugs, no, which are no, legalized. No, no, so no, what? No. It's not drugs. Never mind about that. They're not drugs. What is the solution then to the drug problem? That Very this simple. Has? You smash those gangs oh, because they. Well, you, people have tried that for hundreds no, of years. No, they have never tried that because the police are too afraid they've got friends in the government in in, in in Washington alone you can find in many government buildings cocaine in the toilets you know these guys are on it well Good actually quality. speaking of Washington the US government's getting a bit of a bashing in today's program but um, interesting about the another US government story BP has launched a legal challenge to the ban ah. on doing work for the US government uh, and this is in, in the wake yeah. of the oil spill in the Gulf that of Mexico. That was ridiculous. I mean, what do you think, James? Well, I think, quite frankly, uh, the US government has any, hasn't got any business doing that. I mean, it wasn't the fault of BP. It wasn't. And it's funny how BP, that is uh, sort of more or less an American company as no, well. No, 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 60% right. British, okay, 40% 60, American. But, but still, there's a large amount of American interest in BP. But suddenly BP became British Petroleum uh, when it had all the problems. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I think, I think America has, uh, has got to accept a little bit of the responsibility for this. But the point is, is this. There's so, supposed to be a special relationship between America and Britain. Unfortunately, this special relationship only concerns politicians. When it comes to the countries together, America drags Britain into Iraq and Afghanistan. When it comes to ordering equipment, no. No British companies qualify at all. And the same happens with BP, which is outrageous. What is even more outrageous is that these politicians who receive millions, you know, in, on lecture tours and so on, they do nothing to protect their own companies. Cameron has not uttered a word to Obama about BP and the scandal that the Americans are trying to suck out 42 billion out of it in false claims. This is outrageous. Mm-hmm. And they know perfectly well, by the way, Obama BP knows will that pension under. funds in Britain, yeah. in America, mm-hmm. depend on yeah. how BP yeah. performs. So and guess where the enemy sits? Exxon Mobile is quietly waiting there to swallow BP. Mm. Uh, amazing. Well, I'd like to see uh, David Cameron come out and say something about this because you're absolutely right. This is the story that seems to have avoided everybody. Well, our program exists to say things like they are. So we said it. And that is telling it like it is. And sadly, we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Jens. James Whale, the broadcaster, and Alexander Nekrasov, former Kremlin advisor, joining me, Brendan Cole, here at The Voice of Russia in London. Mm.